Good morning, church family. I'm so glad that you've joined us online on this wonderful Sunday. We get to celebrate together. You know, that's something that hasn't changed. We were saying that for some months, gathering in person, and we're still gathering to celebrate our God when we, we do this on Sunday. So thank you so much for joining us. We're really glad that we get to gather together in this unique way. I want to say if you're joining us for the first time, if you've been visiting with us, or if this is your first time, welcome We're really glad that you're here, and we would love to know that you're visiting with us online today. So we we ask you, please go to our website and fill out the Connect card that is there. That's a card that connects us with you. If you have a question or a prayer request, you can fill that out. Whatever you're comfortable putting on there, you can do that, and we'll get notified and reach out to you to connect with you. But we'd love to connect with you uh, in that way. We also want to connect you to a group. If you're new or even if you've been coming to Connection Church for a while, this is a time of isolation. We've got groups that are meeting online using Zoom at this time. Join one of those groups. I encourage you, if you're interested in that, go to our website, ccspearfish.com, and you'll see the groups tag. Uh, tab. (laughs) There are plenty of groups there that are available and you can click join this group. The leader will be notified. That's a great way for you to connect uh, during this time. And what a powerful reminder of our need for community. I mean, I don't know about you, but if you've been isolating, if you've been on your own, it's been kind of more, you've been more aware of our, the way God made us. We weren't meant to do life alone. Right, Carly? Nope. Nope. See, right out of Carly's mouth. We're not meant to do life alone. We're meant to do this together. God designed us for that. And so we encourage you to connect in a connect group if you haven't done that already. There are new ones being started right now, but now is a great time. Well, we are here to celebrate this morning. We're here to make much of God. Last week, as we started through the book of James, I love Pastor Jan opened up with, hey, this is God's character. Do you see God's character in this book right here? Do you see it? This is who God is. Well, as we start uh, this first song singing, you are, uh, you are My Vision, this is a great song. Each verse just it encapsulates who God is, his character, and we get to celebrate that together. I mean, you got lines like, you're my vision, king of my heart. You're my best thought, day or night. You're my wisdom, my true word, my great father. You're my, my delight, my dignity, my soul's, soul's shelter, my battle shield. This morning, we get to celebrate this is who our God is. And so we encourage you, recognize him this morning, see who he is, and take this time to put away all distractions and to worship him with us this morning, to tell God this is who you are, tell of his great works, to praise his name, and to celebrate him. So sing with us this morning. You're my 
soul shelter and you're my high town. Come raise me heavenward, O oh power of my power. Oh, 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 I don't want, I don't want riches or man's empty praise. You're my inheritance now and always. You and you only the first in my heart. My King of heaven, my treasure, you are. Oh, oh, oh. God is all of those things, our vision, our delight, our soul's shelter. I don't know about you, but during this time, I have just been made so much more aware of my need for God. You know, trials, we will face various trials, as we we saw last week. But you know what trials show us? They show us that we cannot rely on ourselves that we don't have all the answers and we cannot provide for every single thing that we have need for. But you know who does? God does. And this time has reminded me so much in a powerful way, the food on my table, the, the, the shelter over my head and the place I sleep at night, my healthy family. God has provided all of these things and it's shown me we need him. We're in desperate need of him and we can do nothing without him. This morning, let this song be your, your prayer, your confession. God, you are the one that I rest in. You're the one that I rely on. You're everything to us. We need you desperately. is 
is Christ in me. Oh, where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Holy Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. You're my one defense. You're my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. soul to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay on him when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay, my hope and stay, Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, you're my one defense, my Righteousness, oh God, how I need you, oh Lord, I need you, oh I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my Righteousness, oh God, how I need you. How we need you, Lord. Can't do this on our own. Lead us, oh Father. This is my worship, this is my offering, in every moment I withhold nothing, learning to trust you, even when I can't see it, and even in suffering, I have to believe it. If you say it's wrong, then I'll say no. If you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin. When you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. I don't want to follow my own ways. I'm not chasing feelings. Spirit lead me yes. Spirit lead me I want to go with Him It felt like a burden When once I could grasp it You took me further Further than I expected Simply to see you, Lord, it's worth it all. My life is an altar, let your fire fall. If you say it's wrong, then I'll say no. If you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin. 
When you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. Teach me how to follow in your ways. I'm done chasing feelings. Spirit, lead me. Here's how we need you, Spirit, lead me. Lead us, Lord. trust I will obey you're the only truth the life the way I'm done chasing feelings spirit lead me spirit lead me I want to follow my own way His Spirit to lead us, to guide us. We're done. I don't know about you, but I've learned time and time again, and I have to keep learning. Doing it my own way is not the best way. It's good for us to follow. God's ways are good and righteous and holy. He is the only truth of life, the way. Let's remember that this morning. I just want to take a moment to remind you that our time of offering is still a time of worship. We still encourage you at this time to let this be a time of worship. Let this be a moment of response for you. Everything that we do, all of our worship is in response to what he has done for us. I just want to remind you this morning, if you want to give, there are multiple ways that you can give. You can give online on our website, ccspearfish.com. You can go on our app, Church Center, and there is a way to give through that. You search your app store. You can also still mail in things to P.O. Box 1178. Let's pray this morning as we respond in worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are everything that we need. We thank you that you have done. It is finished. All that we need is found in you, and our faith in you is what changes and transforms us. Lord, I thank you this morning that your ways are good. (laughs) Thank you that all of us came to a point where we recognize I don't want to follow my own ways. Lord, I pray you teach us that. Remind us of this truth this morning, that to follow your ways means to walk with you and obey your word. I pray this morning we we would have this kind of spirit. If you, whatever you say, God, if you say jump, if you say go, I'm there, I'm going to do it. If you say to stop or be still, 
That's it. I'm doing it. Just pray this morning, Lord, that we would see your ways as greater than our own. You are master. We're servant. And that's okay because you are a good, a loving, faithful master. You're a father. You accept us and adopt us as children. So, God, thank you this morning. We can worship you. We can celebrate this truth and speak to us. Spirit, transform us this morning to be these kind of people. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. It's meant to be opened, explored, pursued. It's made to be read, reread, applied, and used. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, with wisdom life changing to lead us on. It's made for guidance to teach us His ways, showing what's true, right, and worthy of praise. It's meant to be hidden deep in our hearts, daily examined as the morning starts. No greater glimpse of God do we have, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Good morning. I hope you had a wonderful week, and I'm so glad that you've chosen to gather with us this morning to worship our glorious God. If you have a Bible with you, I'm going to ask you to take it out at this time and open them with me to the book of James. Today we're going to be in James chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. Last week we began a new sermon series through this book called Faith in Action. Now, this book of James is all about action. Out of 108 verses in this book, 59 of them contain a command. You see, James believed and he taught that genuine faith is not in word only. He believed and taught that genuine faith works. In verses 1 through 18, he taught us how genuine faith responds to trials. He taught us that a a, a true Christian, genuine faith perseveres. It trusts God through the trials. Well, this morning, James transitions from telling Christians how we should respond to trials to teaching us how we should respond to God's word. Now, if you enjoy following along with the sermon notes, remember you can go to our website at ccspearfish.com and download the sermon notes, print them off, and follow along as we hear from God's Word. The Bible is called a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. We call it um, the Word of God. We believe it's to be read, it's to be received, and it is to be put into practice practice. Now, we acknowledge these truths about this book that we hold in our hands, but amazingly, our actions do not often display what our words say about this book. And what I mean by this is we say it's the Word of God, but we rarely read it. We we read so many of the other writings in this world, but the one that was given to us by the creator of this world is often neglected. Well, not only that, Not only do we not often read it, but sometimes when we do read it, we don't even respond to what it says. Now, I've been a follower of Christ since a young age. Uh, I've sat in numerous Sunday worship services. I've heard many sermons preached. I've been preaching myself for eight years, two years supply preaching as as churches needed somebody to fill the pulpit, six years full-time. And all my years of hearing God's word preached, and in my few years of preaching God's word, I've learned that his people respond differently at times to his word. Well, this morning I've taken the liberty of labeling different types of responses that God's people have to his word. And while I believe there are really only two responses to his word, and these labels that I've created will reflect this truth, I've labeled them differently because I believe it helps us to better see while there might be multiple responses, there are really only two. 
Now, please understand now, these differing responses that I've listed are not limited to just hearing the word preached. They, they include when it's being taught to you in a group or when you're studying it yourself. Because even when you're reading the word of God, in a sense, even if you're reading quietly, you're hearing what God's word says. And also, as I list these different types of responses to God's word, I'm not saying that a person or person's response is the same every time they hear the word of God. As you hear some of these responses, you will find that you, yourself, at different times have been one or more of these types of hearers, just like me. I mean, as you listen to this message this morning, you're going to fit into one of these four categories. So I've developed four categories of hearers. I'm using uh, the language of James here, talking of, referring to them as hearers. So four categories of hearers that describe different ways people respond to God's word. The first is fruitful hearers. This is the person who, or persons who come in maybe Sunday mornings, they hear the word of God preached, they receive it with humility, and they do what it says. So, so there's fruit. God's word says, do this. Their response is, I do that. So this is the fruitful hearers. Second, there are what I call the forgetful hearers. Now, this describes the person or persons who hears what God says. They, they maybe even agree with what God's word says. They believe they're supposed to do it, but immediately they walk away and forget what they heard. Uh, and, and the result is they do nothing. I've responded this way before, and I bet you have as well. And why does this typically happen? I believe there are a few reasons, but one is this. Oftentimes, we come to his word very distracted. We're hearing from God's word, but we're not listening to, to it. Our, our minds are running wild about so many other things. And although we hear what it says, because our mind is elsewhere, we immediately forget once the hearing is over. So this is the forgetful here. So we got the fruitful here, the forgetful here. And, and, and then I believe we have what's called the heated here. This is the person or persons who hears the word of God because what it says confronts their lifestyles. It confronts their ideologies, their incorrect understanding of Scripture. Uh, they get mad. They, they get mad at the preacher who preached on it, when in reality they're mad at the God who said it. And they leave angry, and they do not do what God's Word told them to do. And Christians, please understand, this type of response does not just describe an unbeliever. I have been preaching long enough now and have witnessed those who profess to be Christians get angry when God's Word confronted their sinful lifestyle. I've preached on sexual immorality and those who are having sex outside of the marriage uh, have gotten upset. I've preached on divorce and remarriage and people have gotten upset. I've preached from God's word on homosexuality and people have gotten mad. When, when I've preached texts that confront some Christians misunderstanding or their incorrect beliefs about scripture, some have gotten upset. These are what I call heated hearers. They hear they get hot-headed, they close their ears to what is said, and they don't do what God's word says. Finally, there's the headstrong hearers. Now, this is the person or persons who comes to God's word with their own presuppositions of what he says on a matter. They bring maybe their tradition or the way they've been taught in the past with them to the hearing of God's word. And, and let me be clear here. Tradition and what we've been taught in the past can be a good thing. What we've been taught in the past can protect us against a false teaching in the present. But the headstrong here is the one who's decided that no matter what is revealed to them by God's word through preaching or self-study, they're not going to change their mind on a matter. Sometimes this is the person who's been taught incorrectly in the past and they refuse to humbly hear what God's word says truthfully on that issue. This is the person or persons who comes in puffed up with pride, already having determined in their mind their stance on that issue, and they have no intention of changing their position, even if God's word says differently. The results, they hear the word of God, but they do not listen to it, and they do nothing. I believe the headstrong here also describes those people who are upset about something or maybe with someone that they've encountered in the church in the past. Maybe they've had a bad uh, past experience with some people or preachers, and because of that bad past experience, they still refuse to obey God's word in the present. They hear the truth from God's word, but they stubbornly refuse to humble themselves and obey it. These are what I would call headstrong hearers. So there's fruitful hearers, there's forgetful hearers, there's heated hearers, 
and there's headstrong hearers. And I'm sure if we put our minds together, we could come up with uh, a number of other ways to classify hearers. But these are just a couple of the ways I've put them. And if you listen closely, you'll have noticed what I, what I said from the beginning. Although I listed four different responses, there are really only two. There are those who hear God's word and disobey, and there are those who hear God's word and obey. Well, through the verses we're about to read from the book of James, he teaches us how Christians should respond to God's word. So let's read these verses together. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray all of us have come together, even though we're worshiping online, I pray that we have gathered to hear from your word, not just to do something that's tradition for us, but that we have come together to hear from your word with the intent of doing what it says. God, I pray that you will humble all of us, myself included, and allow us to listen with the intent this morning to obey what you say. God, I pray, whereas James says, we are doers who act. And God, I know by the power of your spirit who lives within us, you can humble us and you can move us to obey. I pray you do that in all of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So how should Christians respond to God's word? Well, James tells us first that we should receive the word of God with humility. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and while the person is speaking to you, you're not really listening to what they were saying. You're just already formulating your response to them. Here's something I will, <clears throat> little secret I'll tell you about myself. If you don't know me, when you meet me, you can test this and you will see that it is true. When I first meet a person and they're introducing themselves, telling me their name and a little bit about themselves, I am already formulating my response to them in my mind. I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going to tell them my name. I'm going to tell them a little bit about myself, my wife, my kids. If they're visiting our church, I'm thinking of things I'm going to tell them about our church. Well, in the meantime, because I'm speaking in my mind, I don't hear anything they're saying. And if, when I leave that conversation, if somebody in, in one of the other seats or somebody else I go to talk to says, hey, who is that? I would not be able to tell them their name. Why? Well, because I was already speaking on the inside while they were speaking on the outside. I wasn't listening attentively to hear them. I, I used to have a captain that I would paint his yacht for him, and he had this saying. Anytime he would come in to talk to any of our managers in, in this organization, he would say, I want you to listen to understand. You see, he believed and knew that oftentimes people heard what was being said, but they weren't really listening. They weren't listening with an intent to do anything about it. Well, oftentimes we do this with God's word. We come to his word speaking rather than listening. Right now, some of you are doing this. Right now you are. You are hearing words coming out of my mouth, but you are speaking in your mind. You, you are thinking, hey, what am I going to have for lunch after 
service today. You're thinking, what am I going to do this afternoon? You're thinking about something you have planned for this week. You, so you're hearing words coming out of my mouth, but you're not really listening. You're speaking in your thoughts while God's word is being preached. And if that doesn't change, your response today will be like the forgetful hearer. You'll walk away having heard something from God's word, but you'll immediately forget what he said. And the result is you won't do anything. Well, this is not the only way we speak with, when God's word is being preached. The headstrong hearer comes to God's word desiring it say what they want. They're ready to read into the text what they desire and not hear what the text really says on that matter. Rather than coming to the word with open ears and open mind and a humble heart ready to receive what God has to say on that matter, they come to the word with pride. They're already talking and they're ready to tell God's word what they have to say on the matter. You know, sometimes we come to the word speaking rather than listening because we want to justify our actions. Now, on the one hand, I think it's great that we go, hey, let's go to the word and see what it says. But so often we go to it like with an attempt to justify something we have done or something we want to do. And if it doesn't say what we want, we become that headstrong hearer who chooses to disagree and attempt to explain away the text. We, tr we try to find a way around it. And so God's word will say this and we immediately will go, well, surely that's not what it means. And we attempt to find it to, a way to make it fit with our desired lifestyle or ideologies or our understanding of Christianity. And what's happening when we do this is we're speaking rather than attentively listening to God's word. One pastor said this, we cannot really hear God's word when our minds are on our own thoughts. We need to keep silent inside as well as outside. See, that old saying is true. You know, God gave us two ears and one mouth so we would speak less and listen more. Well, James tells us, he commands us, when we come to the word of God, we should be quick to hear, slow to speak. In other words, come to the word of God with our mouth closed, our ears open, ready to listen to what he has to say. This is humbly approaching the word of God. Next, he says, we should be slow to anger. We call the word of God a light unto our path. Well, <laughs> it is equally a light that reveals the darkness in our lives. And God works through his word to reveal sin that is in us. God's word confronts our sinful lifestyles. It challenges our false ideologies, and it even opposes our incorrect understandings of scripture. And you know what? Sometimes this makes us angry. Uh, I have two of my best friends who live in a, another country sharing the gospel amongst unreached people groups. Now, when I first came to pastor the church that they were at and began preaching the word of God, my friend's wife didn't like me very much. Uh, she, she disclosed this truth to me a few years later, so it wasn't like she walked right up and said, you know, I don't like you, sir. Uh, but as we became friends and we developed relationship with their family and our family, she just told me, she's like, I didn't really like you that much. And I asked her why. And her answer was, my preaching confronted her ideologies, her understanding of things, her beliefs. And being the mature Christian that she is, she came to understand it was not me who was upsetting her. It was God's word that was confronting her thoughts and her beliefs and making her angry. And this can happen to us all. Uh, one pastor said, anger is a very natural emotion that is an all but automatic response. Even for believers who are not spiritually prepared to anything or anyone that harms or displeases them. This is so true. It can happen to any of us. We can hear something and, and just get angry about it. Well, James commands us when we come to the word of God to be slow to anger. Why? Well, first of all, when we're angry, we stop listening. You ever heard something being preached? Maybe you've heard me preaching and, and then I said something from God's word that upset you and made you very angry. You know, the first thing that happens is you close your ears and you quit listening to anything else that is said. So, so this anger prevents you from listening to the word of God. And because you're angry, guess what happens? You end up disobeying the word of God. James says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When we get angry with God's word, refuse to listen to what he's saying, and we go our own way, typically we do not live out the behavior God commands of his followers. See, hear this. Righteous behavior is not typically the result of, ma of man's rage. 
unrighteous behavior is often the result of man's rage. Let me, let me repeat that. Righteous behavior is not typically the result of man's rage. Unrighteous behavior is often the result of man's rage. G James here commands us to be slow to anger. When we come to the word of God, we need to rid ourselves of our worldly thinking, our worldly desires, and our worldly ideologies. He says we need to put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. What's he telling us to do? We need to receive the word of God with humility. You know what? I believe this takes some spiritual preparation. Have you ever gone into a conversation, maybe it was with a boss man uh, or, or somebody else, maybe a loved one, and, and you knew that when you went into that conversation, they were going to say some tough things to you. Maybe there was going to be a little bit of criticism. And, and, and knowing that you were probably going to hear some hard things when you walk into that meeting, you prepared yourself. You prepared yourself to hear it. Uh, you prepared yourself for how you're going to respond. Well, well, I believe that when it comes to hearing God's word, knowing we're going to likely hear something or things that confront us, I believe it's imperative that we spiritually prepare to receive what he's going to say. I believe this is equally true when hearing any of God's word, even that which encourages us. And what is awesome is while James is commanding us how to respond to God's word, at the same time, I believe he gives us some ways that we should prepare ourselves to receive his word with humility. And what I've done is I've packaged these as five prayers to pray in preparation for hearing God's word. They're, they're in your notes. First one is this, pray, God produce in me a desire to listen to your word. God, give me a longing for your word. Give me a desire to hear from you. Second, God, allow me to be quick to hear, slow to speak and slow to anger. God, please close my mouth, open my ears, put away my worldly ways, and allow me to be open to hearing what you're going to say. Third, God, put away all distracting thoughts of this world. Pray to God asking him to remove all those distracting thoughts that might invade your head as you hear from him. Fourth, pray, God, reveal any sin in my life and help me to put it away and walk in your ways. Walking in sin can certainly hinder our hearing from him. The psalmist said in Psalm 139, 24, he, he prayed, see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Ask God, when you're coming to hear his word, ask him to reveal any sin in your life. Repent of your sin. Ask him to lead you in the way everlasting. Finally, pray God, Prepare my heart to receive your word with humility. Pray asking God to remove your pride, your presuppositions, and, and give you humility as you hear from him. Now, before we continue going this morning, I'm going to ask you to do just that. Take a moment now. Go to God and ask him to prepare your heart to receive his word with humility. Ask him to, to not allow you to be the forgetful here this morning, or the heated here, or the headstrong here. Ask him to prepare you to humbly receive what he's about to say to you. Let's, let's take a moment now, and all of us pray this. Heavenly Father, our prayer this morning is your people, is that you give us humble hearts to hear from your word. I know we all, myself included, sometimes come to your word distracted. Our thoughts are running wild. We're speaking when we should be listening. God, help us to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger this morning as we hear from your word. Humble us as we hear your word preached. And God, I pray that we do what you say. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to encourage you every time. 
before you come in on Sundays to hear his word preached, before you go to your small group to hear the word taught, before you sit down to study the word of God yourself. Take time to spiritually prepare yourself to hear from him. Pray prayers like this, asking him to humble you. Because we should receive his word with humility. Second, James tells us to remember the word of God habitually. He says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer only, or not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Twice in these verses, James points out, this man forgot. Uh, The man who forgot describes the man who hears the word of God only, but doesn't remember what it says, and the results are he doesn't do what it says. James telling us, don't be like that man. Don't be like the man who forgets God's word. Remember God's word. I mean, he told the Israelites to remember his word. In Deuteronomy 6, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. He he wanted them to remember his word. Well, when we hear God's word, James is saying, don't be the person who just lets it go in one ear and out the other. Remember it. Listen to it. Let it soak in. To look intently into the word carries the idea of digging in deep and letting it soak into you. We need to remember God's word. Why? Well, according to the psalmist, it helps us to not sin against God. Psalm 119, 9 through 16 says this. How can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to the word? I will seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lip, I recount all the ways that came from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes and as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Did you hear that? The psalmist meditated on God's word, rejoiced in God's word, and he remembered it. Why? So he wouldn't sin against God. We must be, we must not be like the man who forgets. We must remember God's word. One of the things I've noticed as I've gotten older is that scripture memorization seems to be something we no longer see as important or or we tend to treat it as something that is only to be done in children's ministry. I've even heard Christian parents referencing scripture memorization for their older students as something they should have moved beyond, as if it was only for little children. Where do we get this kind of thinking? A couple years ago, a year and a half ago or so, we looked at a book called The Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald Whitney. And he said this of scripture memorization. Many Christians consider scripture, spiritual, the spiritual discipline of memorizing God's word as something tantamount to modern day martyrdom. Ask them to memorize Bible verses and they react with about as much eagerness as a request for volunteers to face Emperor Neo's, Nero's lions. And scripture memorization has really diminished in the church. And maybe this is one of the reasons sin is so rampant in the church. You see, forgetting God's word typically leads to not living God's way in the world. That that is why I believe scripture memorization is such an important spiritual discipline. Whitney actually listed five benefits of memorizing God's word in his book, and I've, I've listed them in your notes. And the first one is this, memorization supplies spiritual power. You think about that. When you've hidden scripture in your heart, the Holy Spirit can bring it to your attention when you need it the most. 
Uh, memorization strengthens your faith. Memorization uh, of Scripture strengthens your faith because it repeatedly reinforces truth, often just when you needed to hear it again. Third, memorization prepares us for witnessing and counseling. The Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance those verses you need when sharing the good news of Jesus and when you're counseling others for their good. Fourth, memorization provides a means for God's guidance. The Holy Spirit will utilize scripture we have hidden in our hearts to guide us. You know you've had this happen before and I've had this occur in my own life. And finally, he says memorization stimulates meditation. When you remember what you heard from God's word, you're able to meditate it on it throughout the day. I love this. Whitney said, when you're standing in a line, taking a walk, driving a car, riding in a train, waiting at the airport, cleaning your house, mowing the yard, rocking a baby, maybe even eating a meal, you can benefit from the spiritual discipline of meditation if you've made the deposits of memorization. Let's not be hearers who forget. Let's be hearers who remember God's word. Now, I believe the diminished view of scripture memorization in the church is the fault of men like me who lead the church. We don't teach the importance of this discipline. We don't challenge you in this area, and we don't help you to grow in this area. And I want to change that in our church. I, I want that our distaste of scripture memorization becomes a delight in scripture memorization. And what we're going to be doing from now on as a church is we're going to provide you with a monthly memory verse that coincides with what we're learning from God's word. This way that you can remember what you've heard, meditate on it, and hopefully do what it says. Today's the first Sunday of the month. And what a, what a perfect time to begin this. And I've included this memory verse at the top of the sermon notes. So this month, the month of May's memory verse is James chapter 1, verse 22. It says this, But be doers of the words and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. See, this verse fits very well with our current sermon series. And it's a great verse to remind us of what God is saying to us through this book of James. Memorize it. Parents, do this as a family. Do this with your children. Those who are single, do this with your friends. Connect groups, do this together. Let's not be forgetful hearers. Let's be hearers who remember God's word. So how should Christians respond to God's word? We should receive it with humility. Remember it habitually. And finally, the big idea of this entire text here is we should respond to the word of God obediently. He says, be doers of the words, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. He looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer forgets, but a doer acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. And I love this. I love what James does here. To illustrate what he means by a hearer only, he, he kind of gives this ridiculous illustration of a man walking up and looking in a mirror, seeing something needing to be corrected and not doing anything about it. Now, now I, I want to tell you, I, I love baseball games. I, I love going to them live. They're fun. They're, they're family-oriented events. And, I, and you know what I really even love, probably more than even watching the game, is I love the concession stands. I love going there and getting me a hot dog. Well, imagine this for a moment, if you will. You're sitting at a ball game with your friends. Uh, all of you decide, hey, let's head to the concession stands. And you get there, you get your drink, you get a hot dog, you get some fries. Maybe you get one of those really, really good fried Oreos. And on your hot dog, if you're like me, you get everything you can think of. You get mustard, mayonnaise, ketchup, relish, chili, cheese, sauteed onions, hot sauce, relish, sauerkraut, everything. I mean, this, this hot dog is pouring over into the little carrier that you have. You head back to your seat, you eat your hot dog. You finish those fried Oreos. You drink that giant size soda only to realize, man, now I got to pee. <laughs> well, you get up, you head to the bathroom. You take care of business in the bathroom. Then you head to the sink to wash your hands. While you're standing at the sink, you're in front of a mirror and you look up and you notice, man, I got ketchup on my face. I got mustard in my nose and I got Oreo fragments all in my teeth. You're, the first thought is, wow, look at that mess. 
Well, then imagine this. You look back down, you finish washing your hands, and you leave the bathroom. You leave the ketchup on your cheek, the mustard on your nose, and the Oreo pieces all in your teeth. That doesn't make any sense. Doesn't this sound kind of crazy? No one would do this. Anybody who had looked up and saw ketchup on their cheek, mustard on their nose, and Oreo pieces in their teeth, they would immediately grab a paper towel and they'd wipe off all this meth. And because they don't have a toothbrush with them, they'd get their pointer finger out and they'd do everything they can to get those Oreo pieces out of their teeth. Well, James says the one who hears the word only and does not do what it says is like the man who sees all that in the mirror and does nothing about it. A doer, on the other hand, is the one who looks into the perfect law, the word of God. And they don't just hear it and forget. Rather, they hear it and do what it says. They act. You see, through this ridiculous illustration, James is telling us the proper response to God's word is obedience. This is how Christians should respond to the word of God. They should do what it says. And he says, those who do will be blessed in their doing. I read in one of my commentaries one time that the book of James is like a series of tests. Tests that reveal whether or not your faith is real. You see, according to James, genuine faith is a faith in action. And when it comes to the word of God, genuine faith hears it and obeys. Jesus himself said, you're my friends if you do what I command in John 15, 14. In John 14, 23, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Let me ask you this, and I really want you to think about this for a moment. When you look at your life of listening to God's word, does your life predominantly consist of hearing it only or hearing and doing what it says? Jesus gave a warning in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 27, to those who are hearers only and not doers who act. Listen to his words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Listen, Jesus goes on to say, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Dr. David Platt once said this, I am frighteningly convinced that countless people within the church listen to the word week by week, and yet it is not planted in their heart, and this is evident because they're not acting on it. Sure, they act on the things that agree with their lifestyle, or they act when it is convenient for them to obey, but when the word confronts or challenges or convicts or tries to change them, they put it aside, forget it, never putting it into action. He said, be careful if this describes your life because this is not the Christian life. In the Christian life, the word is planted in your heart and you receive it like blood to your heart, humbly and constantly. And by the grace of God that moves your heart, you obey it. This, he says, is the Christian life, a life that is doing what the word says. If your spiritual life is built on merely listening to the words of Jesus and not on obeying them, then one day your life will eternally and ultimately end in destruction. The danger is you're going to think you're okay all the way up until that day. James is not teaching that works save a person, but he is teaching a faith without works is dead. It is not a saving faith. Those who are truly saved, those who the word has been implanted, when they hear the word, they do it. As you reflect on your life of listening to the word, do you see evidence of being a hearer only or a doer who acts? If God reveals to you your faith is not real, I pray today you'll obey his gospel. You'll repent of your sins, place your faith in his son, and leave this service a follower of Jesus. Christians, 
As we learned in the beginning, even we sometimes are hearers only and not doers who act. Sometimes we're that forgetful hearer. Sometimes we're that heated hearer. Sometimes we're that headstrong hearer. Well, James is telling us we should be that fruitful hearer. We should be the doer who acts. How should we respond to God's word? Receive it with humility. Remember it habitually and respond to it obediently. As we close out our time of worship together, having prepared your heart to receive God's word with humility, I want to ask you this one question. In what way or ways are you not responding to God's word obediently? And I know there are a number of commands in God's word. There are commands that tell us things not to do, and there are commands that tell us what to do. You look at the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, we learn we shouldn't have any gods before us. We shouldn't take the Lord's name in vain. We shouldn't kill. We shouldn't commit adultery. We shouldn't steal. We shouldn't lie. We shouldn't covet. We also are told some things we should do. We should keep the Sabbath. We should honor our parents. You move over to the New Testament, we get some uh, things we should do and things we shouldn't do. We're, we're told to flee from sexual immorality. We're told to not commit adultery, to not lust. We're told to flee idolatry. Don't cause other to fall into sin. But the New Testament also tells us that we are to love God. We're to love others. We're to preach the gospel. We're to make disciples. We're to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you think about all of these things that you've probably listened to for years now, in what way or ways are you not responding to God's word obediently in your life? Maybe this will help some of you. Maybe this will help God reveal uh, your disobedience. Uh, Ask yourself this question. With humility, ask yourself, what are those commands in Scripture that make you angry when you hear them preached? Ask that. Or, Or this. For these headstrong hearers, what are those commands in Scripture that you're being headstrong about? You, you know what God's word says, but because of some past experience or poor encounter, you've chosen to disobey God because you're mad at man about something. So in what way or ways are you not responding to God's word obediently in your life? Remember, we have the Spirit of God living in us. Well, well, what is He telling you to do or stop doing that you're not listening to? Maybe God's calling you to do something, to go share the gospel with someone. Maybe, Maybe He's calling you to give your life to the spread of the gospel somewhere else in the world as a missionary. Maybe He's calling you into ministry. Maybe He's telling you to use that which He's blessed you with to bless others. In what way or ways are you not responding to God's word obediently in your life? As I think about this being at the opening of James, the book of James gets tougher as we work through it. This is a question you need to keep asking yourself. This is a way you need to continue to prepare yourself to hear God's word. You need to, every week as you come in to hear James or any of the rest of God's word, as we preach it over the years to come, you need to pray for humility in hearing God's word and ask yourself these kind of questions. The proper Christian response to God's word is to do what he says. So what are you going to do? You're going to be like the man who looked in the mirror and walked away? Or are you going to obey? As Caleb comes and plays, ask God to search your heart and reveal your disobedience. Ask him to give you humility, to remove your anger and your stubbornness. Ask him by the power of his spirit to move you to obey his word. Receive it with humility. Remember it habitually and respond to God's word obediently. This is the proper response to the word of God. Heavenly Father, I pray with humility we all have received your word today. God, I pray that none of us are the forgetful hearer who have just heard some of this today, but we're immediately forgetting anything that was said. I pray, God, that we memorize what you have told us today. I pray that that memory verse, James 1.22, is a verse we commit to memory and that we meditate on and that comes to mind that the Holy Spirit brings to us to guide us even as we hear from your word in days and weeks and months and years to come. 
God, I pray that we are not those heated hearers. I know anger is a natural emotion that we have and we can respond heated to some things we hear said or preached. But God, I pray that you humble us all and that every time we come in to hear your word or we sit down to study your word, that all of us pray, Lord, that you remove that anger with us, remove those worldly thoughts, those worldly desires, those worldly ideologies, Lord. Let us come to your word with humility to hear it. God, those of us who are headstrong and disobeying you in some way just because we're mad at something else somebody has done or said, and I pray, Lord, that we see you're our master. You're the one we listen to. You're the one we're accountable to. I pray that we put us away, put us aside our headstrong nature. Hear what your word has to say, and I pray that we obey. God, I pray that all of us are fruitful hearers of your word. That when we hear it, we remember it, and we do what you tell us. God, if there's somebody here today who you have revealed to them they're not a follower of you, they have looked at their life and you have shown them that they are a hearer only and not a doer who acts, I pray today is the day they call on your son Jesus for salvation. Move them as only you can to obey the gospel, to repent and believe in Jesus. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is a light to our path, a light to reveal the darkness in our life. Thank you for the way your spirit, the implanted word, works in conjunction with the written word and reveals those things that are wrong in our lives, Lord. Produce in us, God, a love for you so much and a love for your word and a longing for hearing your word and a longing for living a life that pleases you, that, Lord, that we obey. And I thank you again for your grace in my life. I know so many who are listening today. Thank you for the grace and mercy you've poured out on them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we get an opportunity to respond in worship. And respond and I encourage you to take this time. So we sing through the song we sang earlier. Are we, are we really willing to say, whatever you say, I, I want to not just be a hearer, I want to be a doer. So whatever you say, Spirit, lead me. Take some time this morning to reflect on that. If you need to confess, and as Pastor Jan said, take this moment. Let this be a moment of application for you. This is my worship. This is my offering. In every moment, I withhold nothing. Learning to trust you, even when I can't see it. Even in suffering, I have to believe it. If you say it's wrong, then I'll say no. If you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin. When you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. I don't want to follow my own ways. I'm done chasing feelings. Spiritly. Call on YouTube this morning. It's a heart of band. Oh God, give me a heart of band. Ever after you alone, gold and silver you can say.
you say it's wrong, then I'll say no. If you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin. And when you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. You're the only truth, the life, the way. I'm done chasing feelings, spirit lead me. Jesus, how we need you. We want to be those people who are doers of the word and not just hearers. But we know we can't do it on our own. We know that you, we need you. We need your mighty work inside of us through your Holy Spirit. So transform us today. God, whatever it is that you're laying on our heart, help us to do it, as that song says. If it's a go, it's a jump. If it's a stop, it's a be still, whatever. We're going to trust you and we're going to do it today. Help us, Lord Jesus. Let us not just look in this mirror and go away, but as we go the rest of this day, whatever it looks like, help us to be those people who do what you call us to do. We need you. We're thankful that you are here, and we will follow you, Jesus. Thank you for this time. We pray in your mighty name. Amen. Thank you for celebrating with us today. We hope that you have a wonderful Sunday.